Hello and welcome to episode 15 of When the Flames Go Up, the ATFC podcast with me, Will Brown. Uh, if I sound a little croaky, it's uh, the cold or flu that's going around. So apologies for that. Uh, yes, today's episode, we're going to obviously talk about the last two home games and our free on the bounce streak and look ahead to York City away at the weekend. Before we get into that, we've had an email in from Guy Burton. Uh, if you want to email in, atfcpodcast at gmail.com. Uh, I'll ignore the the praise, but thank you very much, Guy. Uh, he says it probably helps that we're having a good season as well. The first in what has been a dire few past few years. Um, eye to that. Um, and then he moves on to say, I'm curious to know where your listeners are based. I presume that most of them are in and around Aldershot, but you must have some listeners like myself who are now listening abroad. When I listen to Rob's commentary on the BBC and the National League stream, he sometimes mentions so-and-so texting or tweeting from overseas, usually Spain, I think. I'm based in Belgium now, which means there's only an hour time difference to listen to games. Although in the past I've been further afield where the time difference hasn't always been so easy. Um, and then he mentions that we're thinking of doing a feature on where people are based, which I think is a great idea. So if you are, I'm going to kind of go read through the, uh, the latest uh, stats that I can see which is um, we've got 88% from the UK, to be fair. But there's, there's some far-flung places in the UK. So if you're from a far-flung place in the UK, your Jerseys, your Guernseys, your Isles of Mayans, uh, we've got 3% from the United States, 1.86% uh, from Belgium. I think that's two people, to be fair. So there's another Belgian-based uh, fan. Thailand comes in with... With, I think one, that'll be my dad, sorted. And then we've got a um, an array from Australia, Canada, Switzerland, Japan, Taiwan. And then there's six that are unknown. So if you're any of those, or you use VPNs that go directly to those countries, which I presume that's why they might show up as Taiwan. But hey, I'm not, not knocking it, not knocking our Taiwan listeners. Um, get in touch, ATFC podcast at, at gmail.com, um, and we can get you on or record a, a voice a voice memo, that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, let's try and spread the kind of see the spread of old shot fans across the world, which would be nice. Um, so great. Yeah, thanks for thanks for emailing, Link Guy. Enjoy the episode. Uh, we've got Joe, Julian, and Ash on the panel today. And yeah, speak to you after. Right. Well, we'll start with uh, one of two wins in four days for the shots at home to Oldham Athletic, a bumper crowd, uh, 3,000 home fans in uh, the EBB Stadium. For this one, as Oldshot won 2-0, James Daly got his first goal for Oldshot in the 37th minute uh, with uh, Ryan Glover with the assist, a couple of step overs, cut back, uh, kind of dinked ball in and James Daly got in front of his centre back to head it home. Uh, we then had uh, Toladge running through on goal, takes around the keeper, gets clipped and get, wins a penalty. Uh, he misses that on the 76th minute, smashes it into the post before finally Tyler Frost breaks free. Um, half half the ground probably want him to go towards the corner in the uh, sixth minute of added on time. He drives into the box and fires it into the bottom corner to secure the three points for the shots and move them into fifth position. Um, I'm going to come to you first, Julian. Um, what were your thoughts on the, the team performance, uh, two 0 win and, um, and where, it, where it leaves us in that, that table there. Yeah. Hi, Will. It's uh, it was an amazing result, wasn't it? It was everything we could have hoped for and more. The performance was, was absolutely superb. Every player was on it. I was a bit surprised how poor Oldham were. I kept expecting them to to do something, and and it basically never happened, which is really really surprising. And also, they haven't. I believe they they haven't lost away since October. Someone was telling me so. That that again surprised me. Bearing in mind how they played, whether it's just that we were super efficient and we we nullified everything that they had, but to me, they just seemed really sort of. I guess the typical northern team, um, you know, big, powerful, not really very much mobility. I, I love the fact that the uh, right wing back was hooked after about twenty minutes. He um, he was really struggling, poor lad. 
and um, he, he was gone. And then the even better thing was they replaced him. Uh, they moved um, Liam Hogan over to right wing back for a period of time, which, which again was was fantastic from our point of view because he absolutely got roasted too. But um, no, I thought um, I thought Glover was absolutely on on the mark. Uh, if you can give someone an eleven out of ten, he he would have got it. Not only for this performance, but the the absolute one as well, which we're going to talk about shortly. But um, no, a fantastic fantastic day. Result really was never in doubt. And even better that uh, Mickey Mellon was absolutely livid at the end of it, which made my day. Perfect. Uh, I guess that that echoes what uh, you might be saying, Joe, um, on kind of Oldham's um, poor performance. What did you think of the game? Yeah, I think um, you're saying that well because I messaged you with uh, how afterwards how um, surprised I was with how terrible Oldham were. I actually think um, two 0 flatters them a little bit. Um, I think they're the worst. Well, I'm not going to say they're the worst team, but it was the worst performance at the rec from an away side this season. I know we've beaten teams by a greater margin, but I think they just didn't, like Julian said, they didn't really seem to do anything. And at some point you expected them to kick into gear. So the quality they had on the pitch and on the bench, and even when they made the changes, um, James Norwood sort of just, I mean, I don't like him. Um, he sort of just jog- jogged around and then looked unhappy for the entirety of the time he was on the pitch. Um, but I mean, he's probably picking up a massive wage and is is towards the uh, tail end of his career rather than the start. So um, I think if he were a fan of Oldham, you'd be quite frustrated that you got a player of that quality not showing it. Um, yeah, they they weren't good. Um, I don't need to say much more on that. But uh, yeah, what what performance from us as well? Um, I think when we played Oldham away start of the season, we didn't play badly. We sort of I think maybe let the occasion get to us a bit. We we're a little bit rabbit in the headlights uh, with a young team. And I think today we just showed how far that team, uh, sorry, the weekend, we showed how far that uh, our side has come because um, it's majority of the same same squad, quite a lot of the similar starting lineup. And um, yeah, we just, we we bossed them off the park and it was just see us do that at home against a, a, a team of Oldham's pedigree. It was showed we really sort of back amongst it. So I was uh, quite proud as a fan um, being able to watch that. Yeah, great. Yeah, it was it was brilliant to watch, um, especially with performing when there's three thousand home fans is something that historically is never seen to uh, click for older shop. But um, to have three thousand in and play that well, and against the big tide, um, it feels like the kind of perfect performance. Um, and yeah, I'll come to you, Ash. Um, how were your thoughts on the uh, team performance? Um, Oldham, I don't think had a shot on goal. Yeah, that's that is correct. Um, I've never felt so comfortable in a home game. Let's put it the way I did, they did, didn't really offer anything. I was going into the game thinking like it was going to be. I, I said a draw would be nice if we could squeeze a win. Fantastic because I looked at the players they've got, um, had a look at what we were offering, and I thought that they're they're on par with us. We just don't want to lose to them, and we've come out with a win, which really solidifies our place. Um, within that playoff picture. Um, interestingly, um, on the way home, I was speaking to one of the um, couple of the Oldham fans on the um, train, and they basically said, we do not want to come back here for the playoffs, um, which is a good, very good sign amongst what everybody else has said um, prior to me. I think, yeah, I think it was really strong performance. Um, and I think any other team coming here um, should be worried, really, if we're playing that dominant against them. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, I presume those Oldham fans probably went to the George, and that's probably why they're not 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 desperate to get back uh, on the George. However, because I was in the George on Saturday night, um, Laurent Toledge came in, uh, started pouring pints behind the bar. Um, there's a picture of him pouring one of the worst pints of Carlsberg I've ever seen. Um, the George is the best place to get Carlsberg. So then beer wasn't there in that pint that he pulled. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's how the Swiss do it. To be fair, that's how they do it. Um, he also went on the darts board as well. So um, yeah, not sure. I'm not sure of his prowess, but he looked like he had a decent action. Uh, yeah. So yeah, barely a shot on goal. And the only thing I was going to mention was their kind of weird tactic. No matter who was up front for them, they brought on uh, Mike von Talum, who was a an ex shot. Um, and obviously James Norwood as well. And they, they were using the kind of free forwards 
interchangeably a little bit and but the the same tactic was just the diagonal ball from one of the right back or left backs into into that player and it just wasn't working and Monoga expertly dealt with any of those forwards in that central position so I have no idea what they were trying to do or how they've managed to score goals and be uh, to not lose away since October or November as uh, as Julia mentioned so brilliant performance and against the team around us. Um, so as I said earlier, that, that put us into fifth. Um, and then we moved on to the, the game. We, I guess last week we were worried about a bit more, I think. Um, the kind of the hoodoo of Danny Sell returning. And that was Tuesday night's game at home to Ebbsfleet United, which couldn't have started any worse, really. Uh, Toby Edza, ex-soldier shot, um, opening the scoring in the fourth minute. Uh, in, a, in a kind of 20 minutes spell of domination from Ebsley who came out of the blocks a lot quicker um, they had a weekend off um, while we were playing at Oldham um, Laurent Toledge on the 32nd minute equalised from a short corner um, and then another one from a short corner just into um, added time in the first half in the second half came out and James Daly got his second goal in four days um, before the the kind of flashpoint with uh, Haji Minoga and I think it was Polion. Um, Polion kind of tripped him. Minoga kicked out at him and uh, the referee sent him off straight red. So that'll be um, a free game ban. Down to 10, there was a kind of nervy eight minutes where um, Epsilon showed the kind of man advantage. But in classic old shot under Woodridgen style, we uh, countered brilliantly and uh, Brian Glover was able to uh, drill home for about 22 yards so a big 4-1 win at home and that brings us on to um, zero goal difference and that's why I'm going to come to you first Joe um how did you how did you see the game and uh yeah the uh, the poor performance overall yeah I mean I've always, I said sod the goal difference a couple of weeks ago um but it's it's at evens now so sound the clacks and um but no, we're still miles off the other teams. We're going to have to sort of turn everyone over to uh, to um, really improve it. But wouldn't it be funny if we actually did end up with a better goal difference than someone in the currently in the playoff places, considering how far adrift we were? But if we keep defending like we are and we keep winning games, um, it's not it's not out of the question, and it'll be um, retrospectively quite quite funny. So let, let's see what happens. But uh, yeah, I thought last night we went one nil down on four minutes. So went, yeah, probably going to win. I'm a lot more comfortable going one nil down than we are going one nil up, um, which I know we've covered it before. It's just a really bizarre feeling, but I, you just know that this team sort of don't get their heads down at all, and they go one nil down. We don't we don't change our style. We just we know that we can score. Um, I wrote down that sort of every couple of games, Tollard just sort of turns into this man possessed, where he just looks like he can. St- just take on anyone and no one can get the ball off him. Um, and for someone quite physical, his ability to to turn um, and then accelerate is, is really, really impressive. Um, and I think, you know, we, we, we will accept that he is going to play higher up the leagues. And I think when he does, he will, he will be really comfortable. Um, it's just, I think, I know it's not the end of the season, but I think he's got to be one of the best strikers we've ever had. And I don't think many people will disagree with that. I know he's not, we've not had a full season yet, but he's just, yeah, he, he's an absolutely fantastic player and it's a pleasure to watch him playing for us and a privilege. Um, what else have I written down? Glover as well. That that goal um, was just brilliant. Um, what a finish. I've watched it back a few times and, and it's just the way he struck that ball so that the keepers dived the right way, but the way the balls landed and the way it was struck made it almost impossible to save. Um, and the, he sort of had about four Ebbs Fleet to players, uh, four Ebbs Fleet players um, up against him, and he managed to sort of cut it inside, beat all of them, and um, tuck it away nicely at a time when at three one down to ten men, that game could have turned, and we just sucked the um, life out of the Ebbs Fleet sort of chance at a comeback. And yeah, just nice to finish off a game comfortably, um, a bit like at the end um, of the Oldham game on Saturday, where we 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 killed that off just at the right time. Um, I've written down as well that what a fantastic piece of recruitment um, James Daly has been because he sort of, when when um, Barham was injured, I think we all did a sort of collective um, 
sort of sigh of worry because he was a, a key part of that front three. And then we've got Dalian and he's just slotted in as if he's always been there. And um, what, a, what a fantastic player he is as well. Um, so I don't know whether we had him lined up or whether it'd been looking at, looking at him before or whether he just happened to be available at the time that Barnes got injured. Um, but yeah, fantastic signing. And um, I don't know how long Barham's out for, but Barham's going to struggle to get back in the team if he's fit before the end of the season, um, which is a real shame for Jack. But obviously for the for the promotion push, it's it, it's good for us. Um, yeah, I haven't got much more to say on that because I just think it was a brilliant, brilliant performance. Glover um, and also Harfield, actually. I did write that down as another standout performer. Um, and I, I wrote down how shrewd it was that we've tied him down to the end of next season. Um, and we did that quite early on this year. Um, so I think Tommy quite early on has realised what an asset Ollie is. Um, and I just hope we can get Glover to extend. But I wouldn't be surprised if Glover did um, move on in the summer because he's just been Mr. Consistent. And he seems to have sorted out his uh, his cramp issues uh, at 60 minutes every game in this season. He seems to, well, it must just be fitter. Um, that's the only way I can see see why that's happened. But yeah, great match, great performance, happy days. Yeah, love that. Yeah, Glover, since the turn of the year, I think has been excellent. Um, he's now won two man of the matches in a row and two player of the month uh, from the supporters club in a row as well. Um, and as he says, he says in his interview um, post match of this game, he's like he really thinks he should have more goals anyway. Um, and he, and he, that cut in from the right, uh, from the left on his right is um, it's basically Glover all over. Um, it's just they usually do fly wide of the opposite post um, rather than being drilled near post under the keeper um, for a brilliant finish. And on on James Daly, I think uh, I think Tommy Widgerton mentioned that he'd. He'd know he's known him since he was like sixteen or something at previous clubs. So I think he, as soon as he was available, I think Tommy would have uh, would have got a call um, of some description. Um, I'm going to come to you next, Julian. Um, what do you think of the uh, result and the performance? Yeah, it's just it's just getting better and better. It's you know just when you think you've seen it all, they they produce something else. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get there on Tuesday night. Um, midweek ones are a bit tricky coming over from Wales, but. I did have the advantage of listening to it on the on the radio, and the um, the Epsweet commentator was working alongside Rob Worrell uh, for the match, so it's quite interesting to hear what his thoughts were, and he was very complimentary of the shots, uh, and he didn't feel that um, going down to ten men actually made any difference, which was quite interesting because I was as soon as he was sent off, I was. I was almost contemplating turning the radio off. I, I just couldn't bear to listen to 30 minutes of torture, uh, which would have felt like 30 hours probably. But I, I stuck with it and I'm glad I did because obviously they then went and scored the the uh, the fourth goal, which was uh, just, a, as Joe said, just an amazing goal. But um, no, really comfortable commentary, really comfortable game. Um, I thought... Um, Tollage's vision has really come to the fore over the last few games. Yeah, he um, he was able to see Frost um, over his shoulder and set him free for James Daly's goal. And a lot of the goals recently have actually started with Tollage uh, passing the first ball. So, yeah, he's um, he's not only, as Joe said, probably a, you know one of our greatest goal scorers we've had in recent years, but his vision as well just makes him the, the complete package. I think most of the, the attacks actually start through Tollage. But, um, yeah, um, the only other thing I was going to mention was the uh, the short corners. Um, who would have said you know, two short corners equals two goals? Uh, you know, there's there's that um, famous East Bank uh, chance saying get it in the box. But um, I think we'll have to make one up for short corners now. Yeah, I mean, there, there was a moment in the second half, I think, uh, where absolutely ballooned another corner straight over the box where where someone shouted out, should have played it short, which was uh, perfect timing um, and went down well. Um, yeah, so two, two short corners, which you, you could see the reaction where they come to run straight over to the uh, the coaches at the on the bench um, who had obviously been working on it for a while. Um, I think one that I think the corner before that we'd lost the ball at the short corner. Um, so I think that was why 
the next time there was the chance to get it in the box as well. Um, and then perfect to prove them wrong <laughs> with, <laughs> with a goal. And then another one uh, 13 minutes later. Um, Ash, how did you see the game? What were your thoughts on the result and the performance? <laughs> Yeah, just having a laugh because I'm one of the people who is one who despites, despises short corners. Absolutely can't stand them. Um, but again, they've proved them effective. They're getting better for, as the season goes on. Um, with the um, news of the record, the loan of um, Roland Maynesa, um, I was kind of worried. I was kind of like, right, we're a little bit shorter now on the defensive side of it. And then we went 1-0 down and I was like, we're really missing him. But from the moment we went one nil down, it just seemed like it's just like a switch to wake up. Um, the team played very well. I think Glover was phenomenal. Um, really was. Um, Harfield as well. And again, Tolage turned up um to be absolutely, I think Joe said it earlier, relentless really in what he was doing. Um, the sending off, um, yeah, I, I watched it back because initially I didn't think it was. It's one of these that could have been given either way, in my opinion. It depends how the situation is read. Um, I know there was a lot going on um, in the game for the referee, um, Abigail, to um, to see and do. I think um, overall, I know she got a lot of stick in the crowd, I'll put it that way. Um, I think the first half, I think she was fine. I think after that red card decision, there was a little bit of a wobbler in the middle. Um, but I think, as far as referees go, we've had worse, I think. Um, but my big concern is is these silly red cards, really silly red cards. It's really going to undo us if we keep having these silly red cards. Um, the big positive, though, is I believe we did a very similar thing a couple of weeks ago with South End. We were in control of the game, lost a man, and we just fell to pieces. In this one, we didn't fall to pieces, which is a really positive um, sign. Um, really looking forward to seeing what um, what the team can bring on Saturday for sure. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, yeah, we're going to move on to that that red card, I think, as well. Um, and yeah, on the Roland Meniazzi, um, we kind of found out just before kickoff or just before the lineups were announced that he'd gone to Walsall. Um, and obviously, I quickly checked on Walsall's lineup. He's in the starting lineup, and then uh, thirty six minutes in. At 38 minutes in, he scores a goal for Walsall. So, I mean, what a dramatic 24 hours for for Roland. Um, and uh, yeah, so fair play to him. He's uh, he's moved up a league and now he's a goal scorer in centre half. Um, so yeah, that that meant so Hadji Hadji send it off, put Dylan Kadji, the young uh, central midfielder, into the back three for those um, final kind of final uh, half an hour. Um, so I come to you, Joe, on the, your kind of thoughts of the. Uh, the decision for the red card, I suppose, and, and the incident that led into it. Yeah, I think it's one you have to watch back, but it, it was a red card. You can't do what Hadji did and it be seen and not be sent off, unfortunately. Um, stuff like that happens all the time off the ball, but when the ref sees it, you have no other option but to send the player off. Um, and unfortunately for Hadji, it was spotted either by the ref or by the assistant, but where it was on the pitch... I think they both had a pretty clear view and um, yeah, perhaps it was provoked, but players do that. And I think people might know that Hadji's quite easy to wind up and he is quite a physical player. And if they've done their research, that's stuff that is coached into players these days to give a little niggle and see if you get anything back. And from Ed Sleep's perspective, that's worked. And from our perspective, it's um, a key player, I think probably out for, um, I could be corrected on this, but I think three games if it's violent conduct. Um, and having just lost many essay, um, the timing is pretty bad. Um, but big shout out to many essay for the um, performances he put in when he was with us um, for those six games. Uh, we recorded our lone players we've fallen in love with podcast a, a while back. And I think he was working his way into that lineup. Um, but, you know, leaving six games in in a playoff push, he, you know, maybe I'm falling out of love with him now. Um, but yeah. I think we're going to miss Minogue and it'd be interesting to see what the uh, what the defensive lineup looks like uh, on Saturday because we are now looking a bit bare bones, having had a glut of centre backs for a few games and, and players not getting into the lineup. We're now going to be looking at who's going to slot in. So um, I'm a bit at a loss as to I wouldn't want to pick the lineup. That's for sure. Yeah, it's definitely a headache for for Tommy come uh, come Saturday. Um, I suppose we may be waiting on Kobe Rowe to 
to say he's fit. I'm not sure how close he is. Um, yeah, I suppose I'll come to you, Julian, on the on on the red card. But um, yeah, I, I, my my only thought was the kind of trip, the trip up of Hadji Minoga beforehand. Would you say that is a foul beforehand? And if it was seen, I know that I know Abigail was turned the other way. In fairness, so wouldn't have seen that part. I don't think. Um, was that a foul? And then if Hadji had just tripped him up, that's a foul. But he's gone for a kick. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think it's um it's unfortunate. It it was a little bit of handbags and as Joe said, it goes on all the time. But unfortunately when it's done with the ball there in right in front of the ref, you you're gonna get a different outcome. Um so I th- I think it was it was fifty fifty, but it was as Joe said, it was a red card, unfortunately. And it does cause us problems for the next three games. Um I'm not sure as you said whether uh, Kobe is going to be back or not. Um, so the only other thing I can think of is perhaps that we get uh, Max Mullins back into the back three. Although York being quite big and and da- dangerous in the air, I'm a little bit apprehensive of that. So I'm wondering whether Tommy's going to manage to pull out another loan from somewhere in the next couple of days to uh, to fill the gap because uh, it is a bit of a worry, especially as it's going to be three games. But, uh, yeah, I think in answer to your question, Will, I think it was a red card. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll find out soon, I suppose, if it's definitely a three-game ban for violent conduct or uh, some of a um, some of a FA law. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention on the on this game that, uh, yeah, the, the funny moment of the game, I think, was when Glover was announced as man of the match over the Tannoy. Um, and then immediately was one on one with their right back, and he just flew past him, and he just he just didn't move. It was very funny. Um, once they hadn't scored from that, because had they scored from that, it would have been very um, <laughs> just com- just comedic time. It was great. Um, and with us beating Ebbsfleet, that means there's only one team that can do the double over us left this season, which is Dorking, who we've got at home over the Easter weekend. So. Um, only two teams so far, Chesterfield and Eastleigh, have done the double over us in, in the league. Um, and with that win, we're now top of the form table in the last 10 matches, which actually surprised me. I don't know why it surprised me, but it did. Um, we've got 22 points from those 10 games. That does help with uh, Chesterfield just kind of, you know, dawdling into the uh, the title. Um, I've got a question. What... When was the last time Aldershot won four one at home in the league? I'm, I'm going to come to you first, Ash, for for a guess. I'm going to give you. Let's go for a year for this, unless you can remember an exact time. <laughs> no, I can't. I, it's going to have to be a stab in the dark. It absolutely is. I'm going to go 2000, and I'm going to go 2019. That's my gut feeling. Okay, 2019. Joe, Joe, do you want to come in? What year do you reckon? Um, I think it's not actually a very common scoreline for one. Um, with 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 the outcomes you can get in a match, and I think I don't recall one recently. And the fact you're asking makes me think it isn't recent. Um, it's a good deduction. I, I, I think a couple of seasons ago, I don't think we managed four goals at home all season, so it can't have been that. Um, so let's go back in the football league days. Um. 2000 and I can't remember when we came back down the leagues now 2010 <laughs> we <laughs> we were still there don't worry yeah. all right 2010 from Joe um Julian you still you're still muted what's going on I know you can I can ask you to unmute I think Here he thank, is. You. thank <laughs> you I had a problem with, problem with my uh, technical abilities there uh, so I feel, with that, I've forgotten the question. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what was the last time Aldershot won four one at home in the league? The the only one I can remember, um, and it's probably way too long ago, but I think we beat Cheltenham four one. I remember Scott Donnelly banging one in from the halfway line, uh, but that was two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. Okay, all right. I mean, Joe and Julian, you, you've you're definitely closest. And it is in the uh, League Two. It was 25th of February 2012 against Barnet. Beat them 4 1 at home. Guy Maggio, Hilton, Troy Brown, Guy Maggio to go 11th in League Two. Which is pretty mad. I, I haven't got any stats on whether 
we beat Cheltenham 4-1, but that does that's, sound right with that. Dominic trip down goal. memory lane, that is. Yeah. Um, we have won 4-1 at home three times in the FA Trophy since that. So, I mean, that seems to be an FA Trophy kind of uh, uh, result for us. Um, obviously, we did uh, Lewis this year in the FA Cup. 4-1-2. Right, uh, let's get on to the kind of the context for that Evsfleet victory and the other results around us. So there was quite a lot of rain on Tuesday morning. Um, so we had Wildstone Bromley, obviously. Uh, Wildstone f- are going to struggle to get their games in. That was postponed. Barnet against Eastleigh was also postponed just down the road. Halifax Oldham was also postponed. So that's, as you can hear there, Bromley, Barnet, Halifax and Oldham all need to play an extra game. And Maidenhead against Hartlepool was also postponed. Um, so there was a few results around us that matter. Um, Altrinham beat York City 6-1. Obviously, we'll come on to York City in a minute as we play them on Saturday. Gateshead overcome Dagenham 1-0. Solihull Moors 2, Boreham Wood 0. Southend United 2, Dorking Wanderers 0. Chesterfield 2, Oxford City 0. Rochdale 2, Woking 1, and Kidderminster 1, Fylde 1. Um, so Oldershot remained 5th um, after Tuesday night with a 5-point gap to Oldham, who obviously didn't play. And yes, uh, it does now mean, because Bromley and Barnet didn't play, we are 3 points off that coveted 3rd place, um, which is probably the first time I've looked that way and thought, you know what, there's a chance um, I'll come to you first, Ash, this time. Um, how do you see the kind of the league table and the, the playoff situation after Tuesday night's fixtures? Yeah, it's shaping up real nice, I think, um, for our perspective. Um, I'd rather have games with points already won than have games in hand and requiring to win, especially at this time of the season. Um, I think it's not unrealistic that we could, if we keep doing what we're doing, that Bromley and Barnet could be worried about us. We have some really important games though coming up that I think we need to make sure we get at least that draw or win. And it's going to be, I think it's going to come down to how we do against Solihull and Gateshead. Because I think if we get the wins, win against Solihull at home and maybe a draw at Gateshead, if we get the win, even better. I think we start really pushing Barnet and Bromley and as I've alluded to earlier, I don't think any of those teams will want to come to us after they've seen what the result was against Oldham, who are one of the best away teams in the league. Um, and as I say, like the rest of them, I think outside of Oldham now, I think it really is that close rate race there between Oldham, Altrincham, our skates and Soliol. But I not wouldn't be surprised if Bromley and Barnet do get dragged into it as well. Um, but yeah, it's shaping up really good for us. I think we're in control of our own destiny by the looks of things. Yeah, absolutely we are. And uh, yeah, Halifax were kind of the the form team around us, I suppose. They're, they're in ninth at the moment with a kind of game in hand. Um, if they were to win that, they would move four points um, behind us, exactly the same as it was on the, on the, after the Saturday game. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, it probably is top nine at the moment. Is that is that how you see it, Julian? for the playoff race uh yeah i do i think um i think halifax have got to go some to to get in there but having said that as you said if they win their game in hand they'll leap from frog above um Altrincham and, and oldham um I, I agree with what you said earlier on will it's probably the first time i've actually genuinely looked at the top three and thought this is on this this is possible uh bromley have got some quite straightforward games coming up at home um but i think i mentioned it on the pod last week i don't, I don't think there's any easy games anymore i think because there's so many teams still involved in that relegation scrap as well that that each game is going to be um is, you're going to have to earn the right to to win them but uh, i was just looking at the um the olderman gates head run-ins and they have got certainly a tough run in and if you look at the points that Altrincham and Oldham have got, they're on 58 at the moment. You know, they've got to win five and draw two of their last eight to get 75 points. And you know, I had it in my head that 75 is, is going to get us in there. But as I said, we're now looking upwards rather than downwards. I'm I'm really confident that we can, you know, we can give Barlett and Bromley a, a run for their money. 
and um, you know, only being three points behind Bromley now, um, as Ash said, they're going to be, you know, no one's going to want to come to the EBB, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So those, uh, well, where we are at the moment, would get us a home tie against uh, Gateshead. Um, obviously, if we moved up into the third, we would go straight through to the semi-final um, of the playoffs. Um, Joe, how do you see that uh, playoff race shaping up? Yeah, it's um, it's an interesting one. Um, I think when I saw the Oldham Halifax game was postponed, I thought that's this is a really good opportunity for us to um gain some ground on them. And thankfully, we did go and win against Ebbsfleet, and now we've got those points on the board. And and Oldham and Halifax have got an extra game to fit in, um, in an already congested run in. Um, so yeah, that was that was great that we were able to take advantage of of that effectively game in hand on them last night, if that makes sense. Um, but also, yeah, we're looking above us now. Um, I think I mentioned a while back, once Chesterfield has sort of basically got the league in the bag, um, it's a very odd season for Barnet and Bromley from that point um, because they sort of probably knew they were pretty much guaranteed to get in the playoffs um, and they were never going never gonna to win the league. So they've sort of had to keep the points ticking along. Um, I think from a motivation perspective for those players it's probably been quite an odd one to sort of what do we want to achieve um so i think one of those two teams could could drop could drop back into sort of fourth to seventh um and i i don't know whether whether that's going to be barnet or bromley but that we definitely could catch them and i think if if we could nip into third um that's just one less one less game to get to wembley um so Let's see what happens, but I think the way we're playing at the moment, as as both Julian and Ash has said, there's no reason why we can't catch them. And um, yeah, let's 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 see what happens. But fingers crossed. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely the best the league table's looked for many years. Um, I mean that the the round number of the goal difference does help as well. Zero goal difference and sixty three points on the on the board, um, and with three wins in a row as well added in there. And I, and I think also. Um, I, I was asking myself this question earlier. If you look at the last couple of seasons, we've had Chesterfield, Notts County, Wrexham. Who's that team going to be next year? Or will there be a team like that next year? What I think the league, obviously, from our perspective, hopefully we're not in it. We're we're, we're going to be we're going to be up. But that's um, let's be you know um, the other alternative is, is we're still in this league, and um, I think it's going to be incredibly incredibly interesting. Um, title race next season I'm um, looking at the teams that are coming down I don't see them being taking the league by storm at all um, so I think we could be in for a, a much more interesting title race next season um, so yeah I, I don't I don't know if either, any, anyone else could pick out which team's going to take the sort of runaway title um, points total but I mean I think South End I was going to be Oldham before uh, I saw him on Saturday <laughs> but not, not so sure now. But uh, they, there's always a surprise in there, isn't there? That, that does come through, and and the way South End are playing at the moment, and and they're going to have a, a transfer window to to bolster their team. So I wouldn't surprise me if South End are, are right up there next year. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent agree. Yeah, <laughs> South End. Maybe if I couldn't say South End, Hartlepool. They might they might have a little bounce back up because they've had a season just to settle a little bit this season. They've they've not played well, but they're still not down at the bottom end. So they might kick on. I think it's it's going to be very close. Let's put it that way. I don't think there's a standout amongst any of them. Yeah, we'll see. And also, I mean, just to throw in another curveball there, um, Yeovil, absolutely flying, and we'll probably have a, a fair amount of momentum to. Uh, try and get back to where they think they should be which is league two i imagine um so i guess we we usually at this time mention the the kind of relegation battle because it always looks always looks a bit tasty um but we can do that as we preview saturday's game against york city away so they're currently sitting in 23rd position um it's not going very well at the moment as we've mentioned them in the last couple of weeks um joe's joe's friend that he checks in with um not happy with um, Adam Hempshawwood's uh, tenure so far. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, they lost 6-1 to Altrinham in the week. Um, the fans are being refunded for that, um, which leaves them three points off safety. Um, they haven't won at home since the 1st of January, which was against Gateshead. So I'm not really sure what to think of this uh, 
this York City team. Um, I'll come to you first, Joe, I suppose, for, for your thoughts on York City as our opponents for Saturday. Yeah, my um, my good friend um, was at their uh, Kidderminster away fixture at the weekend and he just sent me a message after their draw, um, three words, we are down. Um, he was, yeah, very low, but he just consigned them from going down. He said there was no signs in that performance of them getting out of it um, at all. And he just said, if you bring your shooting boots on Saturday, you will tear us apart. Um, I think there's, uh, he said there's been a lot going on behind the scenes. Uh, the, the ownership at York has been quite involved with the recruitment, um, sort of bringing in players without necessarily consulting the manager. There's been a lot, lots of very odd, odd things going on with how they've built the squad. And I think whichever manager came in, um, was going to have a real struggle. And I think he's, even though Ardley wasn't picking up many wins, what he's saying, my friend was saying, was that um, that they, they weren't getting turned over and might have just about picked up enough points. And and the timing of their managerial change to bring in someone so attacking, so gung-ho, known for that style, when you're in a relegation battle, it was going to go one of two ways and it looks like it's going the way of um, crumbling. Um yeah, so let's hope from our perspective that we can um, turn them over on Saturday. But um, it'd be a real shame to see a club like York go down. Um, they're a club with a big history and I think are good for the league. But um, at the end of the day, the worst teams do get relegated and, and a lot has gone wrong there. So I think if we if we bring our shooting boots, um, we, we, will, um, we will turn them over on Saturday because they are extremely low on confidence. But never good to play a team after a thrashing. Um, and being an older shot fan, we might be losing six one on Saturday, and it, it probably wouldn't be a surprise. Yeah, it would be remiss of us not to say <laughs> to say that playing second bottom is, is basically just a banana skin for old shot, rather than looking at it any other way. Um, yeah, you mentioned there, um, yeah, about them potentially going down. I mean, I think once once we knew Tyler Cordner was going there uh, in summer, and the kind of signings they made. They've got one of the biggest, the bigger wage bills in this division as well, um, and it just shows. I think that the appointment of Hinchwood basically does show complete inexperience of this this level. Because, I, I mean, as you can see from the table, I mean, anyone from fourth, thirteenth down can still get relegated in this league. You need to you need to earn your points, and you need to get get to that. I don't know, fifty points, fifty two points mark, um, and you you can't just. Uh, Flick a switch and start playing attacking football and hoping you you win games. Um, I come to you next, Julian. Um, how do you see the game on Saturday? Yeah, a little bit nervous to be honest because everyone's obviously expecting us just to turn up and, as Joe said, put the shooting boots on and and score a few goals. But um, you know, what's the betting that Tyler Cordner gets put back into the team for the weekend and galvanizes them together? Yeah, you know, they they have got some dangerous players. You know, um, not quite sure how you pronounce it. Akinyemi, um, he can score goals, and um, John Lewis up front can score goals as well. And of course, they they're one of the few teams that um, we haven't beaten at home. They they managed to get a point at our place earlier on in the season. So, it's uh, it's a little bit worrying. You know, those stats you mentioned they haven't won at home for God knows how long. They've drawn the most games. Only Oxford, I think, have won less games than them. It does worry me a little bit, to be honest. So uh, I'm just hoping that um, you know normal service is resumed and we can we can really sort of get perhaps get an early goal. Um, I know Joe likes us to go behind, but um, uh, I don't want to on this occasion. I, I want us to uh, to get an early goal and to uh, and and to really finish them off good and proper. And hopefully with eleven men on the pitch, which should which should help us, you'd think, in this one. Um, and Ash, uh, anything anything to add on on Saturday's game and the the prospect of potentially Tyler Corder in that back line? Yeah, um, everyone's opinions, I think, I've pretty marry up to mine. Um, I'm more in Julian's camp of being a little bit cautious. Um, yes, we go forward, we will score. It's defensively. Um, especially if we make the wrong choice in the starting eleven, as we've touched on before. Um, with Tyler Cordner, I know he's not happy at that club. He wants to move back down south. I think his mind is on that as well. Um, but I I can see it being more like an Oxford City game 
where it will be a close run thing on the day because they won't want to lose 6-1 two games in a row and get battered. So they will set up defensively. But our defence is not going to be as strong as it could be, let's put it that way. Um, I still think we'll come away with it, but I don't think it's going to be as... I think if people are expecting a big result, I don't think they're going to get it at this one. Yeah, I mean, I suppose that is the the only question that that lingers over this uh, this game is who who is in that back five. I know we uh, we we mentioned earlier whether Kobe Rowe might be might be back. Um, I mean, unrelated because I know he's not going to play. But Christian Mag Maghoma has been training with the team on the pitch before games, which is which is good to see. Um, so he he has been kind of mentioned as he might be ready by the end of the season, which is obviously. Um, fast approaching, really. Um, yeah, what what do we reckon for the the kind of lineup? I've I've written here basically the rest of the lineup chooses itself. It's basically whoever gets gets a red card or gets injured um, leaves the uh, eleven. Um, what do you reckon, Joe, for that that Monoga spot? I suppose. Yeah, I think um, Julie mentioned earlier that um, maybe Mullins might come back in just as someone who's played that position this season, um, and I don't think you want to tinker too much with the rest of the lineup. So if we can try someone just to slot in there um it's not an experiment because we he has done it it wasn't a a, a huge, like a massive success but it it wasn't it wasn't dreadful and i think if we just need to try and fill that gap for a game and um, then he could do it but um if obviously if rose fit um then he can come in and and that's not too much of a problem but we i think we've lost we'll have lost that pace that monoga brings and i think that's the biggest loss from from Minogue not being there is 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 he the drive he brings from defence, um because he plays almost as an uh, as a CDM at times when how far forward he's playing, and and obviously changing a defence um is always is always a, a, a pro, is a, can create problems because um you're disrupting your rhythm, and you're playing against a team that you know perhaps if they get one goal when they're really struggling they might then shut up shop so it's going to be really an in, interesting game um when I said. We sh if we turn bring our shooting boots, we turn up and we win. I'm, I wouldn't say I'm 100 percent confident. But I'm think if we get that first goal, um, and then a second one, then it will be game over quite quickly. If it stays a little bit cagey like Oxford, and when they pegged us back or or Kidderminster situation, and they get the crowd behind them, um, they have quite a loyal fan base considering how poor they have been, and they keep they keep turning up. So it'd be really interesting to see um the order of the goals and how that affects the game. Yeah, that was it. A, was it a nil-nil draw? The game in the earlier in the season. Uh, it was one all. I think oh, was wow. there, and I think looking back to, um, I said Oldham was one of the worst performances at the Ret this season. I, I do honestly think the York performance against us. I thought they were they were awful, um, and the fact we we drew that game, um, we we should have won it about. 5-0. I think that was a game early on before Kwame Thomas had scored his first goal and I think missed from about two yards out um, and at the time was getting hounded but obviously since <laughs> he's, he's redeemed himself but uh, yeah they really looked devoid of ideas and and and, um, and quality really. Yeah yeah okay well I suppose let's, uh, let's round up with a little uh, score prediction and, and final thoughts. Um, I'll come to you Julian. Um, final thoughts are Actually, I've just, I just have had a thought, and it is a really random one, but um, I seem to remember Tyler Frost playing in the back three in one of his really early games with us last season. So I'm wondering whether that might be something that he puts in there just to give a bit of um, a bit of pace in the back three. So that might be a, a bit of a, a random call, but it is something that he might look at. But so uh, whoever he puts in there, I'm going to go for a 3-1 victory. Nice, nice. Yeah, I, I, I'm trying to think of, of Frost in that back line. I can't remember if, uh, I think Widrington slotted in there earlier this season with a red card or an injury for a, about 20 minutes. And obviously on, on Tuesday night, we had uh, Dylan Kadji uh, slot in there, who, who did look like a centre-half when he was in midfield. So I'm, I'm, you know, he had a few bad touches in that opening 20 minutes where um, it was probably looking like he might get pulled at half time. 
Um, so he might he might keep that kind of berth that he had for the final half an hour. Um, and Ash, come to you. Your final thoughts and score prediction for Saturday. Um, yeah, um, that's that back that back five question. I've been juggling around with it um, and just juggling around with lots of thought processes. And I'm agreeing on Julian's point with Frost. I reckon he'll put Frost out there and maybe stick someone just on the outside who knows how to play the wing position. Um, so Frost can provide that support going forwards and backwards. My mind did sit on Theo as well, because he might have something to do there. His big strength is holding his position and just clearing the ball away. But I don't know if it suits the position that Hadji plays. Um, so I think it will be Frost um, who will play in that position. I've gone for a very narrow and tight. I've gone um, 2-1 to all the shot and I think it will be just a, it will I, I just don't think there'll be a lot of big opportunities in there because I think York will not want to get get destroyed really if they get a point they'll be happy with that so I think yeah I think it'll be 2-1 I think we'll get the job done but it won't be as easy as people might think yeah absolutely um what would you reckon Joe for your your score prediction for Saturday I, I was I was looking at the York highlights from Tuesday's game. I honestly think if 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 we can get an early goal, which I think we will, um, because I think York and York are nervous and a bit um well, very low on confidence. So I think if we can get an early goal, we'll turn them over four nil. I don't normally stick my neck out that much, but I'll go for it this time. Love that. Love that. That's why I haven't I haven't watched the highlights. So it's a one nil uh worldy strike from someone. Don't know which way. I'm gonna say, yeah, it's Lawrence Hollage, isn't it? It's it's like 30 yard drilled. Uh, Brett Williams away at Dartford Esk um, finish to win it in the dying embers uh, for those travelling up there. Um, I'm not travelling up there this weekend, but after this one, I'm at all of the games, which is something I don't think I've said for quite a while. So looking forward to that. So that's that's York City. And the only other any other business I have is uh, that the Wreck is hosting an England Sea International two days after the promotion final, um, which, you know, I think maybe the bank and maybe a bank holiday. Um, and obviously we'll um coincide with our bus tour, open open top bus tour of uh, winning the promotion final on the Saturday. Um yeah, we're planning it's in Nepal, England C. So that should be a good occasion um for the for the town and the club to host that one. Um Grand. Well let's leave it there and we'll uh be back next week with a Look at the York City game and look ahead to a big one against Solly Moors at home. Something I was going to say, actually, Will, um, you, I think you mentioned in your notes about the the sort of glover Harfield partnership and how well that is blossoming this season. I was just looking through the programme and they've, they've played over 200 games for the shots in total. So there's obviously something there with regard to that. Um Although I know that obviously Glover wasn't primarily left back, uh, left wing back last season, but um, you know if, if that had been a question, how many games have they played in a shot shirt? I wouldn't have thought it'd be over two hundred. Yeah, that's amazing. And also they played together or around the same time when they were both at Bournemouth growing up. Um, so they played played with each other and played in a similar system before. And Glover in his post match um, after last night's game said. That they're both really experienced in like underlapping and overlapping, and I was thought that's so interesting that that they both must just be on the same wavelength just from playing that kind of same youth football with the the brand and identity that Bournemouth have had for the last decade, I suppose, or the Eddie Howe years, um, and and previously before that. Yeah, it's very interesting. Nice. Um, I'll probably I'll probably stitch that in to be honest. Two hundred games, love that. Thirteen goals. Glover's got thirteen. Okay, that's interesting. Thirteen goals for yeah. us. So whether or not that figure could be a little bit higher, not not sure. He'd he'd want it higher, wouldn't he? Definitely. I think so. Yeah, hundred twenty-two. Yeah. I was just reading for the program. One hundred twenty-two appearances. Glover's made thirteen goals. Behind me, that's he's getting into. Yeah, I mean, I love I love the bloke. He spoke so well in the post match. Just mm. it just seems like he. 
he, he apparently kind of went into the change room and was like, yeah, we can do this. We can get promoted. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> that's the spirit. That's someone that's seen the hard years. He knows. Yeah, it must be nice for him considering, I mean, he wouldn't obviously say how bad it was before, but like, it must be counting his lucky stars that he's playing with this team considering who he was playing with before. Um, God, you know, I, I, I actually didn't think he was brilliant the first season. I think he was quite inconsistent and he was frustrating because he went down with cramp. And I think he's just, it just shows you when you've got players who of that quality and you have better players around you, it can actually show you how good you are. Um, just depending on who you're playing around. Yeah. Abs- uh, honestly. Yeah. I think that's, that's, he's basically a confidence player that's now come into this team and everyone else around him's confident and he's just risen somehow like almost above them sometimes. And it's really hard to yeah. pick a man of the match half the time. Um, other than Tolad and Stokes, who we just kind of forget about. They just score two goals or get a couple of <laughs> assists and we just ignore them. <laughs> Lovely to see uh, Danny Sell so happy after the defeat as well. Yep. <laughs> I just, said that, it, that they should have had a corner four yes. minutes before we scored. <laughs> no, to be fair, I, was, I didn't actually bring that up on, the, on this, but I, I don't yeah. know if I wrote it down. It was the most obvious corner I've ever seen in my whole life. But I mean, it was, event, it's so long before the goal. Yeah, I didn't realise it was that far before. But in my, I walked out the the ground saying, you know, that you know, we shouldn't really got that first goal. Like they went, up, we went up the other end and scored. But I didn't realise it was four minutes later. Well, but, it might have rounded out. It was definitely a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a really weird one. I don't know if there was another. There was a couple more in the second half, like little throw-ins where it just just it came off Harfield and they they just give it our way. It was a bit bizarre. Um, it all balances out. It all balances out. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we've got we've got a red card in the second half, so I mean that's <laughs> that's balance for you. Thanks for listening to episode fifteen of When the Flames Go Up, the ATFC podcast. If you enjoyed it, let us know, share it. We've now got access to the ATFC podcast account on X, which is a big help, and uh, yeah, they'll hopefully help us uh, get it out to all the old shot fans that want to listen in so thanks for listening see you later up the shots <laughs> <laughs>